Thank you for that song. Good morning, uh, Westwood family, to all those that are here. It's good to see you face to face in person. And for those of you that are watching on holidays or for the comfort of your own home, welcome here as well to join with us virtually. You are just as much a part of our worship this morning. Um, my name is Janelle Braun, and I have been a member here at Westwood. I was trying to count how long. It's actually been 20 years since I became a member here at Westwood. Um, and over the course of those 20 years, from time to time, um, I'm invited to speak with you, and I find that such a privilege and such a gift. I'm so thankful for that opportunity. Um, so thank you for being part of my journey and support in, in even speaking this morning. So I'm going to pick up from last week. Um, last week, if you weren't here, Pastor Greg introduced us to the sermon series that we're going to be doing this summer at Westwood. And like Pastor Greg, I too have actually never shared a sermon on the Psalms. But I also haven't been a pastor for the past 25 years, so he's probably preached a few more sermons than me. Um, but that being said, I have heard quite a few sermons over the 34 years of my life, and I can honestly say that I have never actually heard a sermon solely on a Psalm, or at least one that I can remember. Now, unlike Pastor Greg, I absolutely love the Psalms. They have always been one of my favorite things to read, and I'm often drawn to the Psalms. Maybe it's because they're somewhat poetic and rhythmic. I find them easy to read. Or maybe it's because a lot of those one-liners that I've clung to in my life actually come from the Psalms. But regardless of why I love the Psalms, I've always been drawn to them. And that has actually only increased the more that I've studied them. A few years back while I was studying in the seminary at MBBS CMU here in Winnipeg, I took a course with Pierre Gilbert entitled The Psalms. I'll let you guess what that course was about. <laughs> now this was, however, the first time that I had actually ever considered breaking down the Psalms and studying their intent, their literary genre, the purpose, history, authorship, hermeneutic and theological significance. Up until this point, the Psalms had been like an escape for me, a place where I didn't really need to know the context or history, but I could just let them speak to me. Now, throughout university, while I was studying theology as a minor, I had several courses teaching me about these same topics for other parts of scripture. So I took a course on the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible in the Old Testament. And I took a course on the Synoptic Gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and so on. But to me, these parts of the Bible were kind of separate. They were always different, on a different playing field, so you could say, than the Psalms. I certainly appreciated these courses because often those books in the Bible didn't really make full sense to me. And as soon as I started getting extra knowledge and background and history and context, it proved to be so helpful in reading these books. But for the Psalms, I had never really felt it challenging to connect. They were prayers of the people. To me, I, I could relate, I thought. And so this experience of taking the Psalms course was actually quite challenging in both a good and a new way. This course actually challenged me to think of the Psalms by using these principles. So these are six principles that we were taught in this course. The first, to determine who is speaking. The second, to determine if the psalm is personal or corporate. Third, to determine for what purpose the psalm was written. Four, to determine the emotional orientation of the psalm. Five, to determine the genre of the psalm if possible and six, to determine if there's a refrain or recurring word or phrase. Now, when Pastor Greg asked me if I would be interested in preaching on a psalm this summer, I literally could not respond fast enough. I typed back a response, yes, yes, I would love to, I would love to, I love the psalms. But then I began to think, hmm, yes, I do love the psalms. But it's been a while since I've actually pressed into critically thinking about them. And I, as much as I'd want to come up here and share with you my experience, which is valid and good in my feelings, I also wanted to give you some meat, 
some context, some history. So that was the first, I guess, stumbling block I came up to is, oh no, I'm going to have to really press in. And then the second challenge I came across, um, as much as I was excited to share with you this morning, I struggled with deciding what psalm. I could only choose one psalm. One. Well, that would be hard because a lot of my life, psalms have spoken to me. Well, there was Psalm 84. That was one that I heard from a speaker on the Multiplies Trek program in 2005. And it was one that significantly impacted my faith and my understanding of God's love for me. And then there was Psalm 37, a psalm that I clung to that gave me peace as I navigated my life as a single, unmarried woman, learning to trust in God and his goodness and the wonderful plans that he had for my life. Then there was Psalm 23, a psalm that Andrew, my husband, and myself committed to prayer every day after our son was born. It was actually the psalm that we named our son after. And then there was Psalm 46, a psalm that I had heard several times in my life. Well, at least a few lines from this psalm I've heard several times. But this psalm has actually become significant, more significant over this past year of COVID and other changes. For one, this is actually the psalm that we named our second son, Callan, after. Callan means God is my strength. This is also a psalm that we have been reciting every day since the end of January, so I know it in my mind. We've committed it to memory. And I've actually found that speaking this psalm over and over as I pray for my son and put him to sleep, I have come to understand this whole psalm in a new way. There are themes of God's power and God's protection. Especially as we've been walking out this long journey together in isolation and somewhat of an uncertainty during a global pandemic. So let's read this psalm, Psalm 46. I'm going to invite my Aunt Kathy to come up and read for us from the New International Version. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to follow along. Thank you, niece, or as I call her, JD. She'll have that forever. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose stream make glad in make glad the city of God, the holy place where most high dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolation he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Thank you. Thank you. So let me begin by breaking down this psalm for you this morning. I'm going to start off by giving you some context to the author and the original audience and what that author was trying to say to the original audience. I'll also try to answer some of those questions that we were guided to use in seminary. Who is speaking? Is the psalm personal or corporate? What purpose was the psalm written? The emotional orientation of the psalm, the genre, if possible, and determine if there's a refrain or recurring word or phrase. 
Throughout this message this morning, I'll also be tying in how this psalm has spoken to me and my family over the past few months as well. So let's dive in. Again, if you have the Bible with you, feel free to please follow along with me. Psalm 46 is part of the second book, or the scroll, of the Psalms, which Pastor Greg will be talking about later, I believe. He did mention that last week. The author. Well, it says right here in Psalm 46, the author is the sons of Korah. Well, who is or who are the sons of Korah? Korah was the great-grandson of Levi who led a Levitical rebellion against Moses and Aaron, and he was swallowed up by a gaping hole in the earth. You don't believe me? You can read about the story in Numbers 16. His sons, however, were spared, and they were named the Korahites, and they were important supporters of David, and when he made his revisions in the temple liturgy and the personnel, he gave two families of the Korahites responsibilities in the temple. Now, by King David's time, it would seem that these Levites, or the Korites, were actually involved in the musical aspects of temple worship. So there are actually approximately 12 psalms, it's believed, that are written by the sons of Korah. Psalm 42 to 49, Psalm 84 and 85, and Psalm 87 and 88. The exact authorship is not mentioned as these do not have individual names attached to them, like this was written by David, it doesn't have that. So they are somewhat anonymous. But it could be assumed that regardless of their origin within the family of Korah, um, this family carried a great deal of weight regardless of who the author was. So what type of psalm is this? I wish I could give you an easy answer. Um, last week, Pastor Greg gave us a wonderful breakdown of the different types of psalms. He said there was a psalm of praise, psalms of wisdom, royal psalms, psalms of thanksgiving, and songs of lament, and psalms of pilgrimage. Now, in the course I took with Pierre Gilbert, we used a textbook, and it's called Encountering the Book of the Psalms by C. Hassel Bullock. And I'm hoping to actually give this to the church to put in the library. So if you ever want to take it out and reference it, it's a great resource that you're welcome to, to have access to. But I've used a lot of information from this textbook to help me with this sermon. In that book, he actually refers to the themes using a few other names. But even with a little further research, I've seen Psalm 46 fall under a number of categories. Four, at least, that I've come across. The most common is the psalm of trust. And you might say, well, Janelle, the psalm of trust isn't in that list that Pastor Greg gave us. And you're right, it's not. Um, but it could also be like a prayer or a psalm of pilgrimage, which is similar to what Psalm 121 is, and that's what Pastor Greg did last week. But I've also seen Psalm 46 listed as a psalm of praise and a psalm of lament. <laughs> so it covers the spectrum, according to scholars. But for the t sake of today's sermon and for some simplicity, I'm going to say that this psalm is a psalm of trust. This psalm is a song that was written by the sons of Korah, and it was set to the Alamoth, which is probably a musical term. Um, the word Alamoth also means maidens. So it's assumed that this song was probably sung by young women or soprano voices, or it was played to the music of a high-pitched instrument. Interesting. So who is the audience for this psalm? Well, it was really neat that Michaela um, shared that psalm with us in that message earlier, and she was talking about the Israelites who had just come out of exile. Well, is this psalm the same? Is it personal or is it corporate? What is the purpose of this psalm? Well, similar to Michaela's psalm, the original audience is the Israelites, and they've just been in exile. Now, as Hassel Bullock notes in his book, he says, and I quote, the national themes that are interwoven with the personal emphasis of Psalm 42 to 49 legitimize a community reading of the Psalms in the post-exilic. In order to help Israel deal with the exile and dispersion that had devastated the nation and disoriented their faith. So that's the context. You with me? OK. 
Okay. Now with that in mind, let's read through the psalm from that perspective. I'm going to break this up into five sections. Section one. The first section, verses one to three. Now in the Enduring Word commentary, they call the section, The help of God is greater than any crisis. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. This psalm begins with a declaration of faith in the presence and protection of God. The Lord is, or God is, our refuge. Not God was our refuge, or God will be our refuge, but God is our refuge in the present moment and will always be. And God's help, his protection, and his power is not far off somewhere. Where is it? It's ever-present, close with us at all times. Verse 2, therefore we will not fear. Now this is a logic of faith, so it kind of was one of those if-then clauses. So if God is our refuge and strength, then we have nothing to fear. Not even the worst, as we continue to see and when we're reading. Though the earth, this is verse 3, though the earth give way and the mountains fall to the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake at its surging. This is an image of the most extreme natural phenomenon possible. The whole world is falling apart. And yet, in the midst of these things, it's been decided by the author that even in these extreme situations, if God is our refuge and God is greater, well, then God is greater than all of these things, and he is our refuge and our protector. Now, this section ends with the word selah, which means to pause or to breathe. So let's pause and reflect. What did we just read? Take a breath. God is powerful and present among his people, protecting them from harm and evil. If we too are God's people, what does that declaration of truth mean for us? Section 2, verses 4 to 6. Now the Enduring Word commentary refers to this as the peaceful provision of God. And we've sung about this section this morning a few times, so thank you to the worship team who've chosen to embrace songs about the river. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Now the city of God here is referring to Jerusalem. And it's strange that the psalmist is referring to a river in the city of God, or Jerusalem, because if any of you know your geography, there's actually no rivers, no main rivers that run through the city in reality. <laughs> so what is the psalmist talking about? Well, some scholars that should suggest that the author was able to picture the anticipated day that was foretold when a river would flow from the temple itself, maybe the presence of God. Ezekiel 47.12 speaks of this, as well as Revelation 22.1. This image is significant because it represents the abundant and constant provision of God, his presence flowing through the city. Now, these streams make glad the city of God for many reasons. Why? Well, scholars have many ideas of why this would make the city glad. Perhaps because water can symbolize peace. So, a river would be a constant source of peace flowing through the city. But this could also make the city of God glad because water was an essential necessity for life, especially in a landscape, a dry and um, desert-like landscape. It was a needed essential element to survive. Having a source of water flowing through your city actually created a sense of security. Now, why would a, a river, you think of flooding, because you're from Manitoba, you think, oh man, rivers are going to flood. How is that secure? 
But in that time, a river in the city was actually um, one of the best defenses against enemy siege because they would know that there was an abundant source of water constantly flowing into the city, which would be a lifeline. And it would be very difficult if you were to try to capture a city because they had this source of life and water. Verse 5. God is within her, she will not fall. Now, I have to share a quick story with you. It's kind of funny, a little bit embarrassing, but I'll uh, share it with you this morning. So you know how sometimes we dive into the Bible and we like to pull out words and fancy phrases that we think are so great, and then we post them on like a shirt or a picture or wall art, you know, like we've done that. And, and I understand that there's, there's truth in these things. Well, the first time that I actually realized that this passage was in the Bible was when I was walking through my favorite store in the United States. It's my favorite place to go. I could spend hours there. My husband can attest. Hobby Lobby. Any Hobby Lobby lovers out there? Yeah, I'm a crafter. In Hobby Lobby, I could get lost in there. Now, in this decor section, they have a, a place for nursery and children and children's rooms and whatnot. And there was this beautiful, lovely art piece displayed on the wall. And it was for this little girl's room. And it was so adorable. And it said on it, God is within her. She will not fall. I thought, oh, I didn't know that this was in the Bible. Like, this is so beautiful. I want, I want that for me. And, and it is true. God is within us. And God does strengthen us and help us. That's not untrue. But... I have to tell you, unfortunately, the quote is actually not talking about a little girl. The quote is actually referring to a city, <laughs> the city of Jerusalem. So it's just interesting sometimes when you press in, you see there's some context. Verse 6. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. Now this is again a reminder of the power of God. At the sound of his voice, the earth can melt away. Even if the world around us seems overwhelming, all God has to do is lift his voice and speak, and the earth melts. Now that's power. Wow. Section three. Ah, my ears perk up because here we have a repeated chorus. The first of two. So section three is actually verse seven and verse 11. If you have a hard time remembering that, think of Slurpee, 711. Then we have the third section. It's the only repeated chorus in this psalm. So probably something to take note of. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Lord Almighty, also translated as Lord of hosts, indicates that the Lord is the commander of armies, both of heaven and of earth, and this commander is with us. God of Jacob is our fortress. Now there's a specific reference to Jacob here, and if you're wondering who Jacob is, this is Jacob from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the line that God comes through here, and it's actually emphasizing and reminding us of covenant. But it's also reminding us of God's grace. Now Jacob, if you read through the Old Testament, had his flaws and his bouts of ungodliness. And yet God is a fortress and a refuge for those even who have a bad track record by his grace. He's reminding us here in this psalm. Now overall in this repeated chorus, we see God in two ways. There's the God of community, the Lord of hosts, multitudes, overseeing armies. And then we see a very personal God, the God of Jacob. God is both and to us as well today. Verse 7 ends with Selah. So we pause. Take a breath. What have we just read? Section 4, verse 8 and 9. Behold the work of the Lord. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations that he has brought on the earth. 
He makes the wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. It seems very violent and destructive. I sometimes feel weird when I'm holding my precious, <laughs> sleeping baby in my arms, so peaceful, and I'm praying. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. And, you know, it sounds so violent, but it's actually this beautiful invitation here to recite the mighty acts of God and what God is doing. There's a declaration of God's holiness and again of his power. Here's this beautiful image of God not only bringing peace by making wars cease, he actually goes a step further and he destroys the weapons of war. He doesn't just say, I'll stop the war. He says, I'm going to stop the war and remove the weapons. This is another assurance of God's protection and power. This image depicts a world that I want my son to grow up and live in. I want my sons to grow up and live in this reality. Section 5, verse 10, and this is a word from the Lord himself. Be still and know that I am God. Now, how many of you have heard that phrase before? Just a few times, maybe. It's probably one of the most common one-liners that I've heard in my life. Whether it's a word of encouragement from someone, or a prayer, or a song, or a reminder to slow down. I've heard these words. I've meditated on these words. I've held these words. I've seen them. I've actually, confession, even made art pieces for our home that have these words, be still and know. And it's a reminder to me. But now, reading them in this context of the psalm, and all that we've just read, and all that has just happened, I can see that it's a little bit more than just a call to silence. God is addressing us in this section. He's calling us to lay down our opposition and to surrender to him. To be still in this context could also mean to surrender or to let go. Now, we've just heard of God's power and his protection and his provision, and we're actually being called now by God. I've told you these things. Now, embrace this truth. No more arguments or opposition. Surrender. Second part. And know that I am God. Well, to know is to realize or to admit or to acknowledge how great God is and be willing to exalt him in his rightful place, to surrender and to speak truth, to be still and to know. Now, as Boyce puts it, um, Boyce is quoted in my um, textbook that I referred to earlier. He says this in quote, in this setting, be still and know that I am God, is not advice for us to lead a contemplative life. Side note, it is important to have a time of contemplation and to lead some con contemplation and have times of contempl contemplation in your life. But it does rather mean lay down your arms, surrender, and acknowledge that I am the one and only victorious God. I'll say that again. In this setting, be still and know that I am God is not advice for us to lead a contemplative life, however important that may be. It does rather mean lay down your arms, surrender, and acknowledge that I am the one and only victorious God. Then it continues. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. So God's exaltation, the praise and exaltation of God, extends beyond Israel. This isn't just a message for Israel. This isn't just for the temple worship in Israel. This heads to all nations. 
This is for every tribe, every people group, everyone. The presence of God and who God is for his covenanted people is extending out beyond his covenanted people. And then we come to this repeated chorus one final time. The repeated chorus. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And the psalm ends with selah, meaning pause or breath. So let us do that. Pause. Inhale. Take a deep breath. So there is an overview. An overview and a deeper look into the Psalm 46. There's some context, some history, who wrote it, why it was written, and what the author intended by writing it. So then how does this psalm apply to us today, here, 2021, in the pew, at home, at the cottage, in Fernie, wherever you are? Well, I've never been in exile. My people have actually never been conquered and dispersed around the world, and that has threatened my faith. I've, that's never been my context or my situation. But what is my context and my situation? Well, over this past year, I have felt feelings of isolation and forced solitude and separation from those that I love. In the fall, when my husband Andrew and I were expecting our second child, we began to pray for a psalm that we could pray over our child. God led us to Psalm 46. When I read it for the first time, something struck a chord in my heart. God is a fortress, ever-present and near. We have nothing to fear. He brings peace, and with the sound of his voice, even the earth can melt. Now, at this point in time, we were already eight months into a pandemic that I can honestly say I thought would only last two months. I never expected that our second child would be born in the middle of a code red, meaning no visitors, no extra measures, or no visitors, no meals, and extra measures of safety during labor and delivery that weren't too pleasant. But when we read this passage together, both Andrew and I knew that this was the prayer that we wanted to pray over our child. We as parents found ourselves in a different season. At times, it was a challenging season having a new child in the midst of this. But God is with us. His power reigns over us. He is our protector and our provider. Now I want to invite you to step into the truth of this psalm with me this morning. Your life and your situation and your context is different than mine, but it's yours and it's real and it's valid. Where in your life do you need to hear this truth? That you are not alone? That God is with you? That he is fighting for you by bringing about his peace and his protection? I'll give you a moment to think about that in your, in your situation, in your context. And just like Pastor Greg mentioned last week, sometimes we think that these passages are promises and that they're promised that we won't be hurt or we won't experience hardship because God is our protector. Well, if we read it like that, then yes, we will be disappointed. But just as the Israelites were not spared of hardship by any means, nor are we. And yet these words were still true for them then, and they are true for us now. So when we're hurt or times are tough, maybe instead of seeing this passage of Scripture as untrue or a lie or, well, that's not my experience, so that can't be true, think of it as a prayer. Remembering all that God has done and walk forward in faith in his mighty presence. Although I am not an Israelite, coming out of exile, singing together with my community in the temple this song of trust, I am a mother, I'm a wife, a friend, a daughter, 
and a fellow sister in Christ who has felt the effects of distance and isolation this past year. And I choose to embrace the truth in this psalm, to be still, to let go, to let go of all the worries and the uncertainties of what we cannot control, and to know, to declare the truth that he is God, our powerful protector. Amen.